Welcome to Empowering Plans, a show dedicated to identifying waste and undue expense in the health benefits industry, discovering ways to maximize benefits while minimizing costs, and empowering employers, administrators, and consultants to emphasize once again the benefit in benefit plan. Today's episode is brought to you by the Self-Insurance Institute of America, protecting and promoting self-insurance and alternative risk transfer since 1981. Now here are your hosts, the FIA Group CEO, Adam Russo, Senior Vice President and General Counsel, Ron Peck, and Director Attorney, Brady Bizarro. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Empowering Plants with the FIA Group. I am your co-host, Adam Russo, the CEO and co-founder of this great company, the FIA Group. With me, not as always, we're missing somebody today. We're missing the hello, Ron, today. And unfortunately, we just have the backup. Brady Bizarro. Poor old Brady. Say hello, Brady. Hello, Brady. Brady, how's it feel to be in Ron's seat? I'm doing my best, but I got to be honest, uh, it's a big seat. Are you? What are you trying to say about Ron? I'm I saying mean, it's tough to fill. It's a tough. I mean, Ron's fill. gained a couple pounds over the past couple <laughs> of years. We've all noticed that. Everyone talks about it at the water cooler. No one wants to say anything. Folks, feel free to email us if you believe, if you agree with me that Ron's gained a few pounds over the past couple of years. We've noticed that you know he still wears the same suits though. So you know he got a couple of those custom made suits a couple of years back, and he won't adjust them. So I think there's like that go to Jesus moment he has to have and just acknowledge that he has to call a tailor. And just, you know, see if they can loosen those pants up a little bit. Brady? I have no comment on that. Is it because he's your <laughs> boss? Is that what you're that, afraid of? That might be one of the reasons. See, maybe but... I'm, af- I'm not afraid to say those things because Ron works for me. Is that possibly <laughs> why? I- I'm assuming. Anyways, folks, we are really excited about today's podcast. You know, typically we have good people on the podcast, innovative people, industry leaders. But most of the time, the people that we have aren't that smart. We actually have a smart guy today. Brady, I mean, isn't it? It's a little intimidating. It's refreshing, I think. But it's intimidating, too. I mean, this guy is pretty smart. I mean, it's when he talks to you, you actually feel like you're, like, learning something. Yeah, I mean, this is the guy you want to go to if you want to know what's going on in the industry. So, so folks, just so you know, today's special guest is Ryan Work. He's the Vice President of Government Affairs at SIA, which the, if you don't know what SIA is by now, you better <laughs> just keep listening. The Self-Insurance Institute of America. Ryan has been a great part of SIA, probably one of the biggest reasons why Sai is doing as well as it is right now. He's been at Sai for over three and a half years, starting in February of 2015. He did a bunch of stuff before that, but none of that really matters, I don't think. But one of the things I did notice is that he graduated from Penn State, the Nittany Lions. Uh, Joe Paterno was the coach there. Maybe we shouldn't talk about Joe Paterno with Ryan. I don't know Mm. if it's a sore subject. Oh, it's fine, and I'm actually headed up there tomorrow, so I'm I'm looking forward to it. Is there? Are you protesting something there about (laughs) Paterno? No, I'm not protesting anything. I'm just going to enjoy it, so... You enjoy Penn State. It's the middle of nowhere, isn't it? It's it's pretty it's pretty remote, but that's part of the that's part of the glitz and glamour of Penn State. <laughs> so you're leaving DC, you know, the hustle and bustle of DC, and I see Brady like salivating because he just wishes <laughs> he was living there. And you're gonna go to the middle of nowhere just to hang out with a bunch of wacky college football fans, or or a couple of congressmen. Yes. Oh, congressmen! Oh, see how he does congressmen. it, congressmen. He always got. He always has to throw in like even now, even in Penn State, he's hanging out with congressmen. Yes, Brady. Interesting. I like it. Yeah. So I mean, really quick, how good is your Spanish? It's it's okay. It's my my Spanish is okay. The the years that go by, it gets rustier and rustier. But I can have basic conversations. So I don't know if you're aware, but my sister Anya, she lived in Barcelona for 17 years. One of my uh, favorite that's, cities in Spain. Yeah. She's, uh, I, I've gone there at least 20 times. So it's nice to know that I have a couch that I can sleep on if I visit her. But, you know, she's uh, fluent. She's worked as a teacher in Barcelona for many years now. And she plans on staying there till she dies. I mean, that's, that's, that's her. Uh, you spent some time there, right? I did. I, I love Barcelona, but I spent about a year in Spain and I, I love it. So what was the fascination with Spain and the Spanish language? How'd that happen? Well, it was one of my majors at Penn State. So I, I spent my junior year uh, of college over studying and traveling in Spain and Europe. And um, I, I got to use it a little bit. I, I left the hill for a year during my hill stints and spent some time in Latin America. So it, it certainly helped. And, you know, honestly, I use it. I do use it quite a bit just going around places it's always helpful but why spanish though ryan you could have picked any other language or no language at all i mean how yeah why do you decide to be a major in spanish i thought i would actually use it versus something something else you You know my my son in school is learning latin and that's great but i don't think many people use latin i think a lot of people use spanish well you know i went to boston latin school so i took latin for four years (laughs) and you know it was a it's a dead language i mean it was horrible it was absolutely 
horrendous to have to go to Latin class, but it definitely helps you on the SAT. That's oh, and it helps advice. you. It helps you in, in law school and, and studying law. So I'm sure you you know there's words that pop up every once in a while that have you know some Latin background. So I, that's helpful. So Ryan, I'm going to ask we're going to ask a couple questions. Feel free to just you know be very straightforward and honest with your answers. But first question I have to ask: You're a young guy, good-looking young man. You know, little Spanish, Penn State, traveling all <laughs> over Spain, working for congressmen, traveling all over Latin America. Now you're the vice president of government affairs at SIA. I am. How'd I that am. happen? You went in for an interview with Mike Ferguson. What was your thinking? And what, what were you wrong about when you first applied? Like, what's different than what you thought it would be, for better or for worse? Just whatever background you can give us on that would be great. Yeah. So, well, I, I came, I, I left the Hill, and I worked for Standard & Poor's for seven years. And so after we got through a lot of the Dodd-Frank and the Wall Street, Street crisis, I thought it was the time for a change. And so I saw, you know, Mike and I had had some conversations. And, you know, so I went in, um, you know, with my eyes open, kind of seeing what, what he wanted, what the organization was growing into. And, you know, we, we probably talked for a couple of months and, you know, back and forth. And at the end of the day, we decided it was a good fit. One of the things I think that made me excited about it and something I didn't have a lot of experience with was working in the association world, which is different than the Hill, which is very different than, I think, uh, the corporate side of things. And one of the things I think I've really grown to enjoy about my job is working outside of you guys, I mean, working with, with members. Um, so it's working with all different types of the industry, working with people who have so much experience in, in what we do. And I think that makes the job extra, extra unique. Um, you know, some of the challenges we've had, certainly when I came on, on board, is learning the different angles that folks are coming from, but also, you know, largely building a government relations shop from the ground up, which is one of the great tools that Mike has given me and our state guy, you know, Adam Brackmeyer, is a lot of flexibility to do what we need to do to deliver results for our members. And I think that's been one of the, the great parts of the last um, couple of years at SIA. So my question was that if you're a new member of, of SIA um, and you're wondering sort of what is SIA doing for us, what does government relations actually look like in practice? Um, I know every every quarter or so we get a regulatory update from SIA about what's going on in D.C., what SIA is doing on behalf of its members. And, um, for example, one of them that we have uh, just recently got was about the ERISA Working Group, where the committee is focused on getting an updated version of uh, the ERISA handbook, for example, or new wellness rules. So I was wondering if you could just talk about some of the, the issues that the, uh, the committee is currently working on getting uh, passed to help us in the industry. Great. No, it's a great question. I think one of the, the most difficult challenges of, of government affairs work, unlike a lot of other maybe business positions, is it's hard to have metrics. It's hard to say, hey, I met with, you know, five congressmen today or, you know, Congress isn't doing anything. So are, you know, what's government affairs actually accomplishing if the government isn't? Um, and I think part of our job is to, you know, one, stop bad things from happening, which is, I think, maybe the majority of what we do, but also making sure good things continue to happen. And as you mentioned, you know, as these different policy areas come about and policies constantly evolving from a state and a federal level, you know, SAI is trying to change with that. And like you said, you know, updating um, the ERISA handbook or different issues pop up, as you mentioned, these new um, wellness rules coming out of the EEOC. And then there's the constant issues we're dealing with, like protecting, like the Self-Insurance Protection Act, making sure that stop loss isn't regulated uh, on the federal level as healthcare. So there's all these things happening both in the self-insured, you know, healthcare part and also on the captive part as well. So we have all these, while we primarily, from a government affairs standpoint, deal with the government affairs committee and bring things to their attention and get feedback. And, and Ron, you know, Ron is very active in government on the government relations committee. Then it's also talking to our other committees to see what's going on in their world. And so, you know, I think at this point, if I were to say some of, of our priority issues, it's getting the Self-Insurance Protection Act passed in the Senate. It was passed in the House last year by over 400 votes. Um, one of the larger issues we're seeing on the federal level is that states are looking at uh, additional revenue sources to boost their individual market plans. And one of the ways they're doing that is through these reinsurance proposals that could potentially uh, tax stop loss, tax brokers, tax TPAs. And so we're dealing, that's kind of a joint effort between um, Adam on the state level and, and me on the federal is tackling how SIA is going to respond to that and what our, our messaging is going to be. 
So those so are, Ryan, are some of the big issues right now. So Ryan, would you say that that's the biggest challenge that you would say facing like facing our industry today? So I'm going to play a little devil, you know, devil's advocate here. If I'm a person thinking about joining SIA or if I'm even a member of SIA and there's not much going on, you know, your argument could be, yeah, our job is to make sure nothing bad happens, nothing bad is happening. But I think you can understand from their standpoint, well, is it because of you that nothing bad is happening or it's just the landscape of our country? But what would you say is our biggest challenge today? One, part A. Part B, what do you see in the future as our biggest opportunity? What is the opportunity that we need to start taking grasp of and taking advantage of over the next five years when it comes to self-funding our health benefits? Yeah, from my perspective, the biggest challenge, and I think you've heard me say this over and over again as I, as I talk to folks, is we have to educate people about what self-insurance is. And maybe I'm talking about this from a, you know, a Washington perspective, but one of the biggest surprises going back to the previous questions about when I go and talk to policymakers and staff on the Hill is how little people understand about self-insurance or that they, in some cases, they don't even know what it is. And a big part of our job at SIA is to educate regulators, policymakers on all different levels about the role that self-insurance plays in the marketplace. Because I think people would be surprised how little is understood about it. And that is a huge threat because from a policymaking perspective, when something is misunderstood or not understood at all, that's when it's under the biggest threat because that misunderstanding leads to bad legislation. So before you answer the second part of the question, would you say in the past three years, your initial, your intro discussion with policymakers, decision makers, staff of these congressmen and so forth, do you think that the conversation has gone up a level? Is it no longer self-funding 101 and now it's self-funding 201? Or do you still feel like... I, I, would, I would say we're at like the two or 300 level, Adam. I, I think I don't have to go in and spend 30 minutes with a staffer anymore about what stop loss. You know, I can jump in and say, hey, look, here are some of the challenges we're facing. Here's how this would impact us. Um, it, so I, I do think that our conversations start off at a different level, and I think that's important. So what is that biggest opportunity you see? I think as the ACA evolves and more small and medium-sized businesses are looking at ways to make their health care more efficient, improve benefits, lower costs, I think more and more businesses are looking at self-insured options and, and things like the FIA group does, right? I mean, looking at, at claims, lowering healthcare costs. And so those are the biggest benefits and opportunities I see. And that's part of our job as well in government relations is to make sure that those opportunities continue to exist. And again, as we move farther from the ACA and, and either improvements are being made or things are going, are going south in different policymaking perspectives, um, there are opportunities for us to showcase what self-insurance brings to the marketplace. So one last thing I'd be remiss if I didn't bring up on this podcast is the walk on the hill that we had back in February. It was very exciting for me personally, having gone to school for a little bit and lived in D.C. But Why do you have to bring that up every <laughs> single time? There's a good reason for it. I mean, you can't have one discussion without talking about the fact that you lived in D.C. No one cares, Brady. <laughs> I care. I, a lot. I know that you do. I mean, I can't imagine dating this guy. I mean, literally every time they're like, "Yeah, wow, I know that you wow. live in D.C. for three weeks." Yep, Brady, we know. It's more than Sorry, three weeks. Sorry, I apologize. Oh, it's more than three weeks. I apologize, <laughs> Ryan. I cut him off, but I had to. It just gets annoying after a while. So <laughs> why I think that was important, and I was hoping to get some some of Ryan's thoughts on this is: look, government relations is hard work. I know I worked on the Hill too as an intern. Oh, and, again, and- <laughs> again, he just did it again. I know I worked on the Hill as an intern. But, but look, it's, it's, it's important. You can make a difference if you meet with your congresspeople. And we, Adam was with me, and we met with Senator Markey. We met with uh, Congressman McGovern, Congressman Lynch. And we went to them and said, hey, here are the issues that our industry cares about. We talked about with Self-Insurance Protection Act. And I think one of the points that um, Cy was trying to make to us down there in D.C., and for, and for members, I think more broadly is, look, you can go directly to your Congress and write to them. Or if you're in D.C., go visit them and just, you know, convince them that these issues are important. And so, Ryan, I was hoping you could speak to, you know, despite what Adam may be saying, how important it is to uh, either get down to D.C. if you can or at least meet with your congressperson to talk about these issues. Or well, live there for two months. Or, or live there for an intern, you know, um, for a couple of weeks. But, but that's I always mean, a good experience, and it makes people closer to the to the government. So, hey, that's how I, I, I entered for three summers before I started my job on the Hill. So I, I think that our members engaging with members of Congress and even, even their state um, policymakers is extremely important because we can only do so much as staff. And, and on top of that, telling stories about what's going on locally in a district or in a state makes a huge difference. And, and that's not always a story, for instance, that, that I can tell. And, you know, a lot of times we get questions about, well, what's going on in my district? What, uh, what companies are self-insured? What's going on in the state? And so SIA members 
meeting, like you said, you know, whether it be our fly-in or whether it be on separate occasions, which we're happy to set up either in D.C. or on the state or district level, I think makes a bigger impact than in some cases just me going in and, and talking to a, you know, to a staffer. So it's something that we're constantly trying to do more of. And, and you know, I, I wish that more SIA members would make time to do that because I think it makes a big difference. I actually have a, a question for you guys. When you, whoa, when whoa, you whoa, did the walk allowed. on the hill... That's not- that's not allowed. It, it is allowed. It's gonna. It's gonna happen. When when you That's when allowed. you guys Whoa. come into Who's DC, what is the most surprising? Um, what's the most surprising thing that you took away from your hill meetings, good or bad? Oh, jeez. I would say, um, from my standpoint, the most surprising thing would be the level of people that we actually get to meet with. Um, I, I was surprised by that. Um, I think that the people that we talked to actually were more educated relating to self-funded than I thought they'd be. So I definitely uh, would have to agree with your earlier statement in regards to I thought we would be going in there with a piece of paper explaining what a TPA does versus what a self-funded plan does, what the employer does versus a stop-loss carrier and a network. So it was much higher level discussions than I initially thought. That's what most impressed me. Brady? Yeah, I mean, I would echo a similar sentiment there. I think, you know, again... Having some having some experience here, I know how these meetings tend to work. You don't get the member again. You, now he knows how these <laughs> meetings work because well, of the three weeks he spent there as an intern. It wasn't three weeks; it was a year. A but year. I, I remember, you know, that you know most people didn't get to meet with a member, of course, probably not even the chief of staff. But I do recall that when we met, I think, with Senator Markey's office, the um, legislative aide we had talked to was very knowledgeable. She knew right. a lot about self funding, and I also know they had a great picture on the wall. I think it was a map from the Reagan years. That stood in my head. That was a surprise to me as well. So I just want to say, Ryan, I want to thank you for dialing in today and talking to us. I think it was a great interview. Folks that are listening, I want you all to understand this. What SIA is doing, what the Self-Insurance Institute of America is doing on your behalf makes a difference. We need you to become a part of it. We need you to be vocal. We need your money. We need your support. We need your membership because people like Ryan Basically, let's, let's face it, folks. Ryan can't do his job unless he has the membership support behind him, and he's been great in the past in the three and a half years he's been with us. You know, Saya has went from a pretty good organization, I believe, to an extremely amazing, well-run machine. Thanks to this guy. So, Ryan, thank you so much for joining us today. Yeah, thanks, Ryan. Hey, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. We appreciate it, folks. Tune in next week. We're not sure what the podcast will be about, whether it's a vlog, a video, podcast, whatever you want to call it. But on behalf of Ryan Work, thank you so much for joining us. On behalf of Pat Santos, Brady Bizarro, The Absent, Ron Peck, and myself, Adam Russo, thank you so much for empowering your plans with the FIA Group. Have a great day.